<clears throat> Tonight, I'd like to try to impress upon all of us three points. If you don't remember anything else we've studied this quarter, I hope that you will remember these three things because I believe they will help you to remember how to deal with these problems that we face in life. There are three things that Christians should remember. Could we have that first one, please? The first thing is that dreary days are temporary. They don't last forever, generally. And even if they last until we die, they don't last a long time in comparison with eternity. Solomon said in Proverbs 30 and verse 5, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. At night you may be sick, you may not feel good, and yet in the morning you may be feeling fine, the skies are blue, everything is well. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And I believe there's a lesson for us in regard to this matter of suffering. The things that we experience here on earth that bring us pain don't last a long time generally. You may break your arm and suffer for a while, but then you get over it. You may have some sickness, you may get over it then after a while and everything is well. There are times, however, when something that is hurting us may last until we die. But even then, it is not forever. I know someone who has been suffering the after effects of shingles for over seven years. Have you ever had the shingles? You know about the, the pain and the itching of shingles? Suppose you have that every day and every night for over seven years. That's a long time, and it may seem a lifetime if you have it. <laughs> but if it lasts until death, that's as long as it's going to go. It's not going to hurt you anymore. If you're a faithful child of God. You remember that Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, when he talks about the inward man, the outer man, the outer man is growing weaker and weaker. The inner man can be growing stronger. And he says in verse 16, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I said 16, that's 17. Just read the whole book, it'll do you good. <clears throat> Paul teaches us that these things are not forever. And he calls them light afflictions. We've mentioned this, but won't emphasize it. How can Paul say that those things that happened to him were light afflictions? Now, if I were beaten five times, 39 stripes each time, I wouldn't consider that one thing a light affliction. <laughs> That'd be pretty heavy affliction. You think of all the things that Paul experienced, but he says they were light afflictions. How could he say that? But for a moment. They don't last forever, do they? Even if it lasts until you die, that's as far as it goes. Only for a moment compared to eternity. When you think of how long eternity is and how long you'll be in heaven with God, these things that hurt us here on earth don't seem to be very bad things when you compare them. It's a comparative thing, you see. When he says, for our light affliction, that's a comparative thing. If you look at each individual thing, and if it were happening to you, you wouldn't think it was a light affliction. And he says, our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, they don't last a long time. Now, when you think of heaven, you think of all the joys that we will experience there. And these things that hurt us here on earth don't seem to be too bad then. In Revelation 24, or 21 rather, verse 4, John said, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And so when you think of what you're going to enjoy in heaven, these things that affect the outer man here are not all that important. And I believe that one reason Paul was able to say that is the fact that he had his eyes upon the hereafter and upon the spiritual and not wholly upon the material. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, Paul said, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth. Now Paul was able to do that, and we need to strive toward that goal, setting our affections on things above, on things that are spiritual. If we can do that, these things that are material, the things that affect the outer man, won't be that big, they won't be that important. And so Paul teaches us that you can have joy, you can feel good, have peace, as long as you have your mind set upon the hereafter and not the things of this earth. I read a story a number of years ago about a maid who was cleaning house for a lady. And this maid had just suffered the loss of a loved one in death. And just after that, she was cleaning this house and she was humming and singing and was joyful. And the lady of the house said, how can you be so cheerful when you have just suffered the loss of a loved one. She said, well, I was just thinking of my favorite passage of scripture. And the lady said, well, what is your favorite scripture? She said, the passage that says, and it came to pass. It didn't say it came to stay, it came to pass. Now she misunderstood that statement, of course. That's not what that verse means. But that's a good thought, isn't it? And the thought is found in the Bible, even though that verse is not the one that teaches it. Paul teaches that these things are just for a moment. They're not going to stay with us forever. Even if you suffer until you die, they won't be with you after death. And so remember, dreary days are temporary. They don't last forever. There may be something hurting you right now, something with which you are struggling. Just remember... It won't last forever. Number two, we need to remember that all loads do not have to be carried at the same time. You have today's burdens to think about. Troubles and sorrows today. But don't add tomorrow's troubles to today's troubles. Don't add next week's and next year's troubles to today's troubles. In Matthew 6 verse 34, you remember that Jesus was talking about uh, worrying about what we'll eat or drink or wear? And in verse 34, he said, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus says, Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or wear. Live for today. You don't have to carry all of those burdens that you'll ever face in your life today. Just live for today. There was a fable, perhaps you've heard it, about the old grandfather clock that had heard that it, it would have to tick 2,838,240,000 times in 90 years. And thinking of that, it was just too big a burden, and he decided not to tick anymore. Until someone said, you just have to do it one tick at a time. One at a time. And that's the lesson that Jesus is giving in Matthew 6, 34. Take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We don't need to worry about all of those things that may happen tomorrow or next week or next year. We just need to live for today. Suppose you ladies could, I say ladies, I ought to say you people. <laughs> Men wash dishes too. I tell you, I run things in my house though. Dishwasher, vacuum cleaner, and <laughs> lawnmower and all those things. Suppose you could suddenly see all the dishes that you were gonna wash the rest of your life. You'd probably give up in despair. It'd be a mountain of dishes. Or suppose you could see all the floors you're gonna to have to vacuum or sweep the rest of your life. It'd overcome you, you'd say, I've gotta quit, I can't do this. But you don't have to think of all those things you're gonna to have to do the rest of your life. Live one day at a time. That's why Jesus is saying, don't worry about tomorrow. You're going to have to think about those tomorrow, but today, just live for today. 
a bicycling magazine some years ago said that it was easier to ride a bicycle up a long hill at night than it is in the daytime. Why would that be? It's easier to ride up a long hill in the night than it is in the daytime. Because in the daytime, you can see that whole hill. All of that is before you. And you say, I'll never make it. Can't do it. But if you're riding up that hill at night, you probably have a light on your bicycle, but you can only see four or five feet in front of you. And you can say, I can do that. You can keep on doing that. And so it's easier to ride it at night. Well, that's the lesson that Jesus is teaching. Don't add all of those problems and heartaches and sorrows tomorrow, the next day, and the next week to today's. Just live one day at a time. And then number three. There is someone aware of today's problems. They know, someone knows how you're hurting. And that one is concerned and will help you. We need to remember this. In Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 29, Jesus gives some teaching that we really ought to impress upon our hearts and minds. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Now notice, he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? You can get two sparrows for one farthing. Now, a farthing is not very much, you see. We might just say a penny in our numbers so we can understand it. But two sparrows. Now, sparrows are plentiful, and they are of such little value, you can get two for one farthing. But now, in Luke's account, in Luke 12 and verse 6, he said, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Now, if you get two sparrows for one farthing, you'd expect to get four for two farthing. But Luke says you can get five. They are of such little value that you get one thrown in free. They're not worth very much. But Jesus says not one of those little worthless sparrows can fall on the ground without your father knowing it. If God is concerned about that little old sparrow that isn't worth very much, Surely he's concerned about you and your problems. He knows if you're hurting. And he's concerned. And he'll help you with them. Doesn't the Bible say, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you? 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. We can go to God in prayer. We can pray about that thing that's hurting us. But when we get through praying, we need to leave him with God. But do we do that? I read a story a number of years ago about a lady who had five small children, young children. And they were out playing in the yard, and she decided to go next door and visit with her neighbor. So she walked over there and visited a while, and, and then in a little while she came back home, and she saw her five kids all circling something. They were in a circle playing with something in the midst of them. And when she came closer, she saw that they were playing with baby skunks. They had found some baby skunks. And that mother knew if those little old skunks could spray those kids, she'd have to throw them away and start over. <laughs> so she said, run, children. And each child grabbed a little baby skunk and ran with them then. <laughs> now, isn't that the way we work with our troubles, our problems? We go to God in prayer. We ask him to help us with those things. And when we get through praying, we pick them up and take them off with us <laughs> instead of leaving them there with God. Jesus is saying, God is concerned about you. He knows about your suffering. Maybe other people don't, but he does. And he'll help you with it. And you need to pray and ask God to help you. And then when you get through praying, leave them with him. Too many times we take them off with us and we continue to suffer with those things as if we don't really believe in God we don't really trust him to do what we've asked him to do so remember those three things that's somewhat of a summary of what we tried to say thus far dreary days are temporary all loads do not have to be carried at the same time and third there is someone who cares now I'd like for us to go to another 
area. Now, I wonder if you have any thoughts or comments at this point. I haven't given you many opportunities, but if you have something, we'd be glad to hear it. All right. <clears throat> I'd like for us to zero in on some specific areas of uh, suffering. In the introduction to this series, I said I see three areas in which people suffer. One is physical, the second is mental or emotional, and the third is spiritual. And I'd like for us to begin to talk about some of these things. We'll give more time to some than to others because they're more practical for us, I think. First of all, let's look at some physical suffering. And of course, the first thing you think of is sickness. People suffer because of illness. Sooner or later, Every one of us will suffer some sort of physical sickness. Now, I don't have to explain that to you. You understand that as well as I do. All of us have suffered at times with sickness. Some illnesses are very serious and some are not so serious. Now, we might have a, a sore throat or a sniffle or two, or some things that don't really hurt us a great deal. But then there are some illnesses that are very serious. Perhaps you remember reading about the Black Death in Europe back in the 14th century. That plague killed one-third of the population of Europe. Can you imagine that? One-third of the population died because of that plague. Now that's a very serious illness. And so we've seen some illnesses that are not very important, not very serious, but then there are some that are very serious. Perhaps you remember reading or hearing about the flu epidemic here in America in 1918. I doubt that anyone here is brave enough to say they were here then to remember it, <laughs> but you've read about it. Thousands and thousands of people died right here in America in that flu epidemic. And so there are some illnesses that are very serious. We bear some responsibility in trying to get over our illnesses. If we're sick, we can't just sit down and pray that God will bless us and then we don't do what we can do. Jesus said in Matthew 9 in verse 12, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus is saying, if you're sick, you need to see a physician. You can't just sit down and, and pray that God will make you well if you don't do your part to try to get well. There are physical illnesses that we can help and we can get over them. You can go to the doctor. Uh, for example, if you have appendicitis, I believe Steve can tell you about that. <laughs> if you have appendicitis, you can go to the doctor, he can take it out, and you're well. You can get over some things if we'll do our part. If we just uh, sit down and pray and don't do what we can do, I'm not sure that we're going to get well as we would like. But we need to do what we can do. There are some illnesses that we can change by following God's will, going to a doctor, or by taking medicine and taking care of ourselves, doing what we can do. But then there are some illnesses that we can't change. We've talked about Paul several times and his thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Now Paul had something that was a thorn in the flesh to him. We don't know what that was. But nothing could be done about it. Paul prayed three times that God might remove it, but each time God said no. And apparently there was no doctor that could remove it. There are some illnesses that can't be helped. I know of a preacher, and some of you may know him, who went to Faulkner years ago and has been up at um, just outside of Decatur. And he has MS. He has been in such a condition for years that he couldn't even move. He couldn't do anything for himself. His son, I believe, is the youth director over at the university church. Nothing could be, could be done about that. No doctor could help it. No medicine could help it. There are some illnesses that uh, can't be helped, apparently. And we just have to learn to live with them. We are responsible for some things that happen to us. Remember? I pointed out the fact that smoking can cause lung cancer and other illnesses. And uh, if we avoid that, we can avoid that illness. If we drink, we can have cirrhosis of the liver. If we are engaging in immorality, then we can develop AIDS. 
and we can quit doing those things or never do them, and we can avoid some suffering. Now, we are responsible for some things that happen to us, but then there are some illnesses for which we're not responsible. We didn't do a thing in the world to cause it. I've told you that we had a little baby boy who died in infancy. That little baby didn't do anything wrong. He didn't misuse any of the health principles. He was born with a defective heart. And that just happens. Things like that just happen in nature. And God is not responsible for those things. And we can't say, why did God take my baby from me? When a loved one dies, there may be several things that cause it, or one of several. And God's not responsible for any of it. Suffering in this world is in this world because of sin. The devil brought sin into the world through Adam and Eve, and as a result, suffering came into this world. And we are responsible for some things that happen to us. There are some things that may happen to us and we're not responsible at all. And we just have to go to a doctor and we have to do what we can do to try to get over it. And we cannot expect God to heal us miraculously through men today. We don't hear much about these healing meetings today. In my younger days, we used to hear about it all the time, but you don't hear much about it now. Maybe on TV you'll see somebody go to this fake healer, uh, Benny Hinn. I said fake healer, not faith healer. <laughs> A fake healer. They can't heal anybody miraculously. And someone may say, well, you don't believe in divine healing? I do indeed. I believe in divine healing. I believe if we're healed, God did it. That's divine healing. But I do not believe in miraculous healing today. God does not heal people miraculously through men as he did in the New Testament days. And so there's no need for somebody to run to some healing meeting by Benny Hinn or go on television and let, them, let him hit you in the head and knock you backwards. Won't do any good to go Benny Hinn, Hinn to be miraculously healed. He can't do it. Now, some people suffer in various ways. And one of the most terrible ways to suffer is with Alzheimer's or dementia. Last Thursday, a number of us lost a dear friend in Ken Randolph. He's been a friend of mine ever since we were in school together here at Alabama Christian and then at Harding. And he's been a good man, a righteous man through the years. But the past few years, dementia has robbed him of his mind and memory. People can get a disease like that and there's no medicine that can reverse it. No doctor that could cure it. There are some things that happen to us that, that just can't be changed. And we just try to have the right attitude and spirit about those things. Do what we can do. Pray to God about the matter. And then leave it with God. And so sickness is one of the ways in which we can suffer physically. And then second, there is the problem of death. And of course all of us have seen it. If there's not an empty chair in your house, there soon will be. Because death and decay are written upon every living thing. And one of the things we need to realize, that Hebrews 9 and 27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Death is going to come. And we can do everything we can to keep from dying, but it's still going to come. Old age cannot ward off death. If he could, Methuselah would not have died. He was 969 years old, but the Bible says, and he died. Wisdom cannot ward off death. If it could, Solomon would not have died because he had a special degree of wisdom from God, but he still died. Physical strength cannot ward off death. If it could, Samson would not have died. He was probably the strongest man that ever lived among mortal men, but he still died. Righteousness cannot ward off death. If it could, Abraham would not have died. And countless thousands of others would not have died. And some whom you have known right, known right here at Easter Meadows would not have died if righteousness 
could ward off death, but it cannot. It cannot ward off death. And we do everything we can to keep from dying. And some people have the idea that they can escape death some way. <laughs> I read something in a, in a book about a case like that. A bizarre example of someone who had a wrong idea about death. It was Mrs. Winchester, the wife of the man who invented the Winchester rifle. She supposed that as long as she kept adding to her house, she would not die. And uh, she would have a lot of rooms and she'd move one room to another so death couldn't find her. And so she built many rooms to her house and she made many additions to her house and still death found her. <laughs> she slept in the blue room one night and death found her. And it'll find everybody, you see. There's no death, no way we can keep death from coming. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Well, there are two exceptions in the past. You remember, Enoch and Elijah did not die. Both of them were translated that they should not see death. And they're the only two of the people up to this point who have never died. You see, all of us will die along the way unless we're still living when Christ comes again. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, Paul said concerning the second coming of Christ, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so when Christ comes again, some will still be living, and they're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air. And so everybody else would have died, except for Enoch and Elijah. So death is going to come to every person. And the Bible never tries to gloss over this matter of death. It never tries to deceive you into thinking you're not going to die. It does not try to cover up the fact of death. I read last week in the paper about somebody here in Montgomery who had died, a man who was 105 years old. I used to wonder why people would read the obituary column. I never saw that was very interesting. But you know, now I find myself looking at the ones who died in the obituary column. If I don't see my name there, I'll go about my business then, you see. <laughs> but this man had died. Everybody's going to die unless we're still living when Christ comes again. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Solomon said, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. There's a time to be born, and a time to die. People are going to die. And in Psalm 90, you remember that the psalmist, there it is reputed to be Moses, said, the days of our years are threescore years and ten. You know that's 70 years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, that's 80 years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. It's going to come. In verse 12 he said, so teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. So we need to realize that death is coming. We need to number our days and make proper preparation for it. So the Bible teaches that death is going to come. And we can't deny it. We can't uh, do anything to keep from it. It's going to come. Now, the sting of death is felt when someone dies. It's often felt by the one who dies. And it's felt by other people when their loved ones die. A writer by the name of Dr. Kubler-Ross says that uh, when people die, they generally go through five stages. Now, I'm not going to have time for us to really discuss each of these. Let me just mention them. Not everyone, I think, will go through these five, but generally this is the way it works. First, the patient refuses to believe the diagnosis. He says, Doc, I think you've got somebody else's x-rays. How about looking at my x-rays? The next stage is anger and bitterness. When we find or we're told that we're going to die, 
We become angry oftentimes, bitter. And then the next stage is the patient bargains for time. He may say, Lord, please let me live until Christmas. I want to see my grandson graduate from high school. I want to see my daughter get married in the fall. Just let me live until that time. He bargains for time. In the fourth stage, the patient is overcome with depression. He just sort of relaxes and gives up. He's depressed because he knows he's going to die. And then finally, the patient accepts his fate. There is a sting in death, and we don't want to experience that. I don't think any of us wants to die. Paul calls it the sting of death, this thing that you feel. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin. The sting of death has led our generation to use every technological means at our disposal to try to keep us going. We've even started using spare parts. You know, when your car wears out some part, you go to the parts store and buy a part and put it in there and it keeps going. We started doing that with human beings. We put in hearts and lungs and livers and virtually everything else to keep us going. But even after we put all those spare parts in, we're going to die. There's nothing we can do to keep from dying. I believe that if we, if we pause and think about this matter of death and understand what the Bible teaches about it, it's something that's going to come to everybody, and try to have the right attitude about it, then everything will be well with us. If we have the right attitude, we can stand it. I remember visiting, or I was visiting or at a hospital. One of our elderly ladies in the congregation was in the hospital and was going to have cancer surgery the next morning. It was a difficult thing. There was a possibility it might not work. She may die. I visited with her in her hospital room the night before she was to face surgery. I went to try to comfort her, but she comforted me. She had a good attitude. She was calm and contented, not all upset about what's going to happen. She was resigned to accept whatever comes. She said, I wouldn't say I'm sorry that I had cancer because it has helped me. I have gained far more than I've lost. Now, there was someone who understood the Bible and who applied it to herself. She was not going to give up, throw up her hands, give up her faith in God. She was ready to accept whatever would come. Now, if we have the right attitude, as she did, we can overcome death. When we know it's coming, we can overcome it. We can live with it because God will be with us. The Christian can face death with confidence, even though there is some fear. There's a sting in death. A passage that I often use at funerals, and a passage that's used by most preachers, I think, is John 14, 1 to 3. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If we believe that passage, if we'll put it into our own hearts, we can take whatever may come. The doctor may say, you have six weeks to live. We're going to live that six weeks as best we can. Trust in God. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, in chapter 1, verse 21, he said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He didn't say to die is loss. He didn't say it's a tragic loss. He said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In verse 23, he said, For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Death for Paul would be far better 
It would mean to go to be with Christ. But he said, nevertheless, nevertheless, he understood another responsibility. To stay here would be more needful for them, to preach to them and help them prepare for that life to come. And so we need to think about the promises of the Lord, that he'll be with us when we die. You remember in Psalm 23 and 4, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now there are many valleys through which we walk in life. In this audience tonight, I'm confident that there are a number who are walking through one of those valleys. It can come in various ways. But you know, if we, like David, trust in the Lord as our shepherd, he'll walk with us through those valleys and see us safely to the other side. Though death is a part of our living here upon earth, we can say, Lord, I'm going to trust in you to see me through that valley, and he'll lead us safely across. There are people who sometimes lose their faith in God, turn against God when death invades their home, especially when it's a little baby. I've known of parents who would say, why did God take my baby? God didn't take that baby. That's not God's business. That is just a part of life, just as birth is a part of life. And that baby has done nothing wrong. And you can be sure that that baby will be in heaven with God after a while. Now, that brings up a thought. There's a congregation here in Alabama for which I've preached in six meetings, I think. In one of the earlier meetings, it was a number of years ago, I was talking with a man in that congregation. He told me about his daughter who at that present time was in a far country of sin. She'd been a Christian, she departed from the Lord, and was living in that far country. He said, my daughter went to David Lipscomb College when she graduated from high school. That was back when Lipscomb was a different school than it is now. I wouldn't send my daughter there now, I'll just tell you frankly. But at that time, it was a good school. This young girl was a faithful Christian. She attended Bible classes, worship services, lived a good moral life. She was a faithful Christian. And she left Lipscomb, came back home, went to a state school and lost her faith. She went into that far country of sin. And that father said, I would to God my daughter had died when she was at Lipscomb. I understand what he's saying. If she had died at that time when she was a faithful Christian, she would go to heaven. That'd be far better than for her to live until she was 80 or 90, away from Christ and away from the church. I'll say this. I would rather have had my children all to die in infancy than to grow to adulthood and go into that far country of sin. It would be far better for them to die in infancy. Death is going to come to us, and we just need to be sure that we're prepared and do everything we can to help our children prepare for that time. Remember, we can't see the end result of death. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Sometimes it can turn out for the best. If our children die in infancy, if they had to live to be older people, they might have departed from the Lord. So death for them was really a blessing. Death can help us in various ways. It can help us get our priorities straight. I'm sure that all of us know enough about the Bible and so are so concerned about our souls that if the doctor says, you have six weeks to live, we're going to try to make sure we have our house in order. I've had people to come and talk with me when they learned they were going to die. And they wanted to get their house in order. That's the way we'd do it. We would do what we can to get our house in order. Death can help other people. It can motivate them to get their house in order. 
I remember a man that I baptized years ago. His wife was a high school friend to Mackie and me, very close friend. We preached in Wildwood, Florida when I was a younger man. And uh, this lady was there, but her husband was not a Christian. Far from it. He was living way over there in the far country. We moved away from there. Was gone 35 or 40 years. And that congregation was having trouble. Somebody almost destroyed the congregation. And they contacted me and wanted me to come back and help them put it back together. We moved back there. This lady and her husband were some of the ones who really pushed us to come back. He had obeyed the gospel. He had uh, grown tremendously. He had become a deacon. He was the church treasurer. A year after we moved back there, I guess it was, he developed cancer. And he had but a short time to live. And then he died. He had a brother-in-law who was married to his wife's sister. And it shook him to his bootstraps. He came to talk with me at the office. I talked to him about his soul and his need to make preparation to meet God. Just as Keith had done. He obeyed the gospel. Baptized him into Christ. I never would have had that opportunity, probably, if his brother-in-law had not died. But it shook him and made him realize that he was going to die and how he was living. He came back from that far country and became one of the most faithful, dedicated Christians there. That's nearly 20 years ago. And he is much stronger now than he ever was. Very fine, faithful person. Death sometimes helps us to get our house in order. And it also helps other people. It motivates them to get their house in order. Death, of course, can bring sorrow and suffering to us, even though the person who's died is a faithful Christian. Uh, my mother-in-law died in 2010 when uh, she was 93. Uh, that was a hard thing. She had three daughters who were all married to gospel preachers, and we three preachers conducted her funeral. But it was a very difficult thing. I wept all the way through it. Most difficult funeral I've ever had a part in. It was not because we were concerned about where she's going to spend eternity. I have no doubt that she'll be in heaven. But it brings sorrow to us. And that's always true. Let's prepare to meet God ourselves, and then we can face it with the right attitude. And let's learn from the deaths of others to get our house in order. Well, our time must be up. Paul is back in here. We'll stop right there and we'll take up there.